in this episode of Gareth Jones on Speed, I'm on my way to the Welsh Alps in an entirely appropriate car. Hello, welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed. I'm Gareth and I'm not really travelling at speed at the moment. I'm doing a regulated 60 miles per hour on the M1 North, as I often do when I'm heading home to North Wales. But I've got a mission. As you know, I'm on my way to the Welsh Alps, or Snowdonia, as they're more properly called, or Erri, if you're speaking Welsh, which you're probably not, but I do. And the car I've got for this trip is an Alpine, not an Alpine, an Alpine, yes, I've got an Alpine A110, not, you know, a Chrysler Alpine, no, or even a Renault 5 Alpine, because, oh, can you hear the rain, by the way, it's really raining and a bit unpleasant, so I'm quite happy to be travelling at 60 miles per hour in this I don't think any faster is safe there's lots of standing water on the ground and I'm very close to the ground in the Alpine A110 not as close as you might be in a Lotus about as close as you might be in a Porsche Boxster and this car actually reminds me of the Porsche Boxster it's got a Turbo 4 like the, the latest Boxster it is very light made out of aluminium it's mid-engine with a little boot at the back and a longer boot in the front perfect for the weekend for me and I overpack so there's probably enough for two people and yeah like the Porsche it wants to go oh the turning on this car it's always a joy when you get into a proper sports car because this Alpine ruddy well is a proper sports car not just because of its heritage which I'll discuss later but it's got everything in the right place hasn't it a lightweight turbo 4 in the middle aluminium chassis you sit low the seats by the way one piece proper sports seats there's absolutely no adjustment of the rake or the height or the seat back it rolls backwards and forwards and you know what took me about a second to find a perfect position it's very very good proper you know Italian I know it's not Italian but a proper Italian driving position low short legs long arms that's me all I had to do was really adjust the reach of the steering wheel the height I've got it at its maximum and I've got something close to perfection I took it for a drive yesterday. It was delivered in the morning to my house in North London and I had to do a Mersey dash to Stevenage. That's an awful thought, isn't it? But I'd had a fairly major IT failure at home and I urgently needed a specific type of hard drive to go in my NAS, my NAS, my network attached storage a raid of four drives and it told me that one of my four drives had failed and it was busy shuffling all the data onto the other three drives but I need to replace drive four quickly so luckily I had a quickly car and I think it's always good to familiarize yourself with a car before you go on a long journey and I knew I had the 260 mile trip to North Wales to do today so I thought, well, I'll nip up to Stevenage from North London. It took me about 45 minutes in this. To be honest, if I'd have let it do what it wanted to do, I'd have probably got there in about 15 seconds. Blimey, trousers. It really wants to go. It's this turbo engine. It's great at low speeds, but at high speeds, Lord above, it just keeps accelerating. It was on the M25. And, you know, the traffic was moving steadily. And I just wanted to pop past a couple of cars. So, pop past, looked down, and I wasn't doing anything like a legal speed. And it had gone from, what, 60 to warp velocity in seconds, 
which wasn't what I'd intended at all. It rather took me by surprise. It's a 248 brake horsepower, I think it's 248 brake horsepower car. Maybe 250, maybe 260, I'll have to check the spec and get back to you. And it weighs next to nothing. So it absolutely picks up speed and goes in a way that you just forget that performance cars can do. It's a proper sports car. The chap who dropped it off for Group Renault, because Alpine are part of the wider Renault group and have been for some time, he delivered it on a trailer for me. And he said, oh yeah, we deliver them on a trailer and then we send a driver to collect them. They worked really hard, he says. Oh, there aren't that many of them and all the journalists who have them requested them early and they've had a great time. We've already had good reports about it. Well, we'll see about that. I will give an honest report of this car, but I have to say everything I've discovered so far has really made me grin. Oh, which is a good thing. Because I'm heading to Wales today for a number of reasons. Got a couple of meetings, going to see some friends and going to see family because tomorrow is the anniversary of the passing of my dad many, many years ago. But it's always a sad day and I can never get by the day without feeling sad. So I figured I'm going to go home and be in Wales on that anniversary day tomorrow and make myself happy. Being there makes me happy and being there in a fabulous car makes me happy and being in an Alpine... It's going to make me really happy. A nice distraction. Uh, not a midlife crisis. No. But you have to manage the sad things in your life. Admit that they're sad and do happy things when you can. So I should be doing happy and sad things in this car tomorrow. Visiting my brother. And like I say, going to the Welsh Alps. I'm going to do some spirited driving where possible. On some marvellous roads. Because classic cliche I know but it would be rude not to you've got a car like this you absolutely have to find a great road to drive it on don't you uh, we're not sure to know in North Wales so lots of good reasons to go to North Wales I've got lots to tell you about this car what shall I tell you already it's white we'll start with the basics so you can build a picture in your mind if you've not seen the picture on the website for this page of Gareth Jones on speed or seen any of the pictures I shall tweet about this car yeah it's white I was disappointed slightly because the one I thought I was going to get was blue that sort of lovely French blue metallic that uh, I said there with a French accent didn't you hear that metallic which an Alpine should be the classic Alpines that rallied in the 70s the original A110 should be blue really it should be but hey beggars can't be choosers and also the spec changed at the last minute they changed the car at the last minute the car i was going to get i think was called the passion spec which has lots of extras that this version of the car doesn't have this is called the pure i like that it's a nice way of badging the poverty spec version of the car pure no, we have not spoken it with anything. It is very pure. So this car doesn't have a reverse camera. It doesn't seem to have parking sensors either. I've heard no bleeping at all. And frankly, I think a reverse camera would be really useful on this. Being mid-engine, view out the back is a bit tricky. And the rear window really is a letterbox. I'm sure we journalists often describe the rear view as being a bit of a letterbox but this is a letterbox every time I look in the mirror <laughs> I'm reminded of a scene in a film the film's called Slade in Flame it's a film Slade made in 1974 telling the story of a band called Flame and they played the part of the members of Flame and there's a tremendous scene in the film one of my favourite scenes, probably my favourite scene in the film, where a man from an advertising company who were thinking of getting into rock and roll and managing a rock and roll band and branding them and making money from them. This is set in about 1967, 69, something like that. A man from this management company turns up at a house in the Midlands, it was actually shot in Nottingham, looking for the lead singer of this band. 
played by Noddy Holder. He's called Stoker in the film. And he walks up this classic northern terraced street, goes up to the door, and there are trucks and construction vehicles around. They're sort of knocking down the whole street, and there are a few people on the street who don't want to move. Very much a zeitgeist, spirit of its time scene. And this posh chap in a suit knocks on the door, gets no response after a few minutes or 30 seconds he bends down and he looks through the letterbox opens up the letterbox and a woman an old lady behind the letterbox and he can see her eyes and hear her voice what do you want she says oh, hello mrs stoker i'm here to see your son he's not here she says he got away oh do you know when he's back he never come back the way she says, he never come back. Breaks my heart every time, it's so funny. And yeah, she was talking about her son, her grandson's father, her grandson being played by Noddy Holder. So every time I look at this letterbox rear window, it reminds me of her scene. So another reason to be happy. Fancy having a car that makes you think of Slade. Yeah, to be honest, I could probably look at a Skoda and think of Slade, couldn't I? It's what's in your head. But this car, its rear view, could do with the camera. You know, you sit so low that you can't see the extremities of the car. It's not quite like a Lotus where you can see the fenders. You can't. It's a bit more swoopy, the nose. You don't sit quite so low as you're at axle height. You're just above it. But it's a glorious thing. I've mentioned the turning, the steering. I think it's probably electrical steering but it's just terrific, it's light. Some people think that sports cars should have a heavy, firm steering. Not necessarily, not when it's as direct as this. It's bang on. Lots to observe on the inside of this car. These seats, I've mentioned the seats, proper sports seats, one piece with nice slots in them so you could put on a four, maybe a five point harness if you wanted to go racing in this and I strongly suggest you would it's a tremendous track day car I bet it is I bet it is they're suede covered and they're padded on the side with this lovely diamond pattern stitched style oh and that's on the doors as well and the doors aren't completely covered there's lots of bare metal all the way I rather think yeah it's plastic super light but that sort of bare body colour white. Actually, I think it would benefit from a stripe. I think this car should have two stripes down it, asymmetric in size, black on white, a narrow one and a wide one alongside it, possibly down the middle, possibly off to one side. It's the sort of car which can carry off something like that. Not all cars can, but this definitely would with its, like I've said, heritage and spec and ability for sporting prowess it's glorious it really is little details on the inside as well like the tricolore the french flag the blue white and red on the left hand side and red white and blue on the right hand side depending which way you're looking at it on the door panels and outside as well actually when i pulled up outside this hard drive place in stevenage yesterday as i pulled up the chap was getting out he said, what, what, what is that? I said, it's an Alpine. An Alpine? I said, no, an Alpine. I had to explain the difference, and I will explain that later on. But he said, oh, I thought it was a Porsche or a Lotus. And there you go. It's exactly what I said. It sort of occupies the space somewhere in between those two cars. And I think that's a lovely place to be because some people complain that a Lotus is too stripped back and the Porsches these days are too specked up so something in between probably be a good catchment area to steal people who might have thought of buying a Lotus and to go for those who perhaps can't afford a Porsche although in terms of price I think this car is about £49,000 but with the various options it has including I think it's the sat nav and the metallic white paint or the signal white paint perhaps 
it brings it up to about £53,000. There are other options as well. I'll have to check the spec of this actual car and let you know what they are. So it's a lot of money, £53,000. Inside, is it Porsche quality? It's very close. It's very rigid. The doors go click. <laughs> the French click when you close them. They don't go thunk, but they don't go twack either. You know what I mean? And it makes a good sound. I'll perhaps demonstrate the sound a little bit later. I won't at the moment as I'm doing 50 miles per hour on the M1 in a controlled speed zone with very narrow lanes. But inside, you've got lots of soft material. You know, this the sort of faux leather soft plastic of the dash is really nice and the sat nav looks nice and the switch gear looks nice it's very limited actually there are one two three four five sort of uh, what would you call those like trip switches i suppose they are underneath the sat nav screen and the buttons for engaging gears yeah this isn't a manual car at all it's got a dual clutch gearbox i'm not sure what renault called their dual clutch gearbox but it's got one of those so it's got paddles paddles as big as the horns on a viking's helmet oh hang on telephone excuse me i gotta take this hello darling you're all right A video cassette recorder for 25 quid. Wow. What input do we need for it? Well, is it a video cassette recorder or is it a video cassette recorder DVD combo? No, just a cassette. Okay, I don't know if that will help us. We've... Okay, well, uh, forget it then. That's all right. Yeah, thinking. good spot though. For loads on eBay as well. Did you look on eBay? I haven't, no, I will. Um, they're all like 25 quid and stuff, but I didn't look for DVD ones, so maybe they're more expensive. Yeah, okay. all right. I thought it was worth just checking before it went. Okay. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, we've had technology problems recently. That was Violet, by the way, of course. I've got a lot of material on VHS that I'm trying to digitise at the moment. And one of my technical problems recently is that the device that we use to transfer VHS to DVD or video file has failed recently. So Violet and I are discussing what we're going to do about that. What was I telling you about before the interruption? The switches. Yeah, it's got a seven speed dual clutch robotized gearbox with paddles as big as a viking's horns which is anathema because i'm sure many of you listening to this is saying but vikings helmets didn't actually have horns yeah it's one of those bad facts that a lot of people carry around with them that viking helmets have horns they didn't. We've always depicted them as horns. I think possibly because some of the depiction of Viking gods may have shown Thor with little wings on his helmet. And someone extrapolated and made them into horns. Don't even know if Loki had horns on his helmet. I know he does in the Avengers, but I don't know how much of the design of Thor and Loki from the Avengers is actually taken from depictions of those gods in North mythology look that up for me i will when i get a moment but not right now but anyway yeah it's got these paddles got really tall horns unlike viking helmets which didn't have horns which is great because no matter what the wheel angle is and it's a very high rate the gear as well i bet it's two and a half turns lock to lock you can always reach the paddles because the paddles don't move with the wheel they stay fixed so that's why you need long paddles. And it's got three buttons to engage drive. You've got a big orange start button in the center console. And above that, you've got drive, neutral, and reverse. Three big black buttons arranged at nine o'clock, midday, and three o'clock with neutral in the middle. And it's nice, you know, bang, bang, off you go. But you have to be careful not to go bang, bang. Because if you hit drive twice, you engage manual mode then you take off and you wonder why it hasn't changed out to first despite the fact that you do 45 miles per hour 
so you press it once and the gearbox works automatically press it twice and you engage manual mode and uh, oh I've dabbled changing up and down in manual mode and it really responds ever so quickly it's fab so much good stuff in this car too much to tell you about at the moment I'm going to drive for a little while I'll report back but hey not a bad start to this journey this lovely lovely car right then I'm on the Midland Expressway and as you can hear I'm slowing down as I approach the toll plaza so I can pay my toll and accelerate away so you get to hear the sound of this sweet little French cheeky lady so uh, let me just open the window pay with my card and here we go and that's the legal limit <laughs> Better close the window. It makes a cheeky little noise, doesn't it? It's a raspy little thing. And because I'm holding the recorder, of course, I couldn't paddle up and down and do it in manual mode. But as you can see, the gearbox, or as you can hear rather, the gearbox seem to make those changes at exactly the right point. And it's a little bit damp underfoot, and this is a very very short wheelbase car. It's quite wide, but very short wheelbase. So I have to admit to being slightly concerned that I might swap ends here. But it does have anti-slip, some form of traction management, which I could have turned off if I was feeling bold. But as that's the first time I've floored the throttle of this car, fortune may favour the bold or the brave, but I think being circumspect will keep you pointing in the right direction. <laughs> Garrett Jones on speed! You can probably hear the wind whistling across the microphone and maybe some birds in the distance. I'm in North Wales in my Alpine. I've been here for a couple of days. I haven't been driving the car very much because the weather was so very, very good that I climbed two mountains. First one, 1,800 foot. Second one, 2,000 feet. So I've been kind of busy using my legs and went out in the car again today. And I thought I'd stop and just give you a flavour of, of what the car looks like. I'm sure you've seen pictures of the Alpine A110, but it absolutely evokes the spirit of that great sports car, the rear-engine Alpine A110, from, I think, around about 68, but it certainly was rallying in about 72, so maybe a bit later than that. Forgive me if the exact dates aren't right. They've done everything, you know, they've got all the design cues there, the quality of the headlamps, a sort of slightly very French nose. A great car. The original car looked beautiful. In fact, my mate Damien, who you know, Damien, who came to Le Mans a few years ago, his favourite car in the world is the original Alpine a110 so when i told him i had a new one he said he hated me if you like the old one yeah it's great engine's just in the right place lots of styling details the tail end for some reason reminds me of an audi a7 if you look at the back end of an alpine a110 the new one and compare it to an a7 there's a bit of familiarity there don't know what it is two boots it's got a little boot in the back behind the mid-engine which is big enough for two reasonably sized well smallish backpacks but yeah two definitely and in the what do we call it a fronit yeah perhaps no i don't know what do you call the storage space under your bonnet in the mid-engine car a frunk i think the americans call it don't they the front trunk the front fruit the front boot the fruit that's it it's a fruit i think i've said that before haven't i yeah get a massive old backpack in there or even a saxophone i carried my son indy and his saxophone in it the other day what a car 
what a car i've been using sport mode a little bit did some driving on the mole denby road in sport mode the other day and when i went up to moil vamai this mountain the first of the two mountains i drove getting in the car now that's what the door sounds like and um, because it's a small volume he said bending around to get the seat belts because it's a small volume the windows drop when you close the door so you don't get a pressure bubble on the door so close easily first time nice details do you want to know about alpine i've been telling people about alpine people have been saying well what is it no is it a porsche is it a ferrari uh, i said no it's an alpine um the chap who founded alpine i think his name was jean redelay I think that's how you pronounce it, Jean Redelet, who put a company together in about 54, 55. He was racing Renault, I think, four Chevaux, four CVs, modifying them to do road rallies. And he was very successful in an event, I think it was called Coupe d'Alpes, something like that. And because of his success in that competition, he won it. He started naming his cars Alpine which was a great name for a car that you might want to cross the Alps in at pace. But there was a bit of a problem because the name Alpine was owned by some being a British company. So they couldn't sell the cars as Alpines in Britain. It was very complicated. They did quite well, won the World Rally Championship, I think, in 72 or was it 1973? And then got into financial trouble. So they were absorbed by Renault. They have a factory in Dieppe in northern France where they build Alpines. They used to build the Alpines. Renault absorbed them, developed them. During the 80s, they produced a bunch of cars that were supposed to be rivals to the Porsche 924. They were rearranging. They were fab cars, but perhaps not as fab as they should have been. And they got a bit pudgy and out of date. And by, I think, 89, they were marketing the Alpine designed and developed cars as the Renault GTA in the UK. And then in 95, they went away. But the interesting thing about Alpine is because of their heritage in motorsport, along with Gordini, another racing French motorsport brand, they were both absorbed into Renault to form Renault Sport. They developed a Formula 2 chassis, I believe, helped Renault get into Formula 1 with the turbocharged engine. So they've played quite a big part, haven't they? Not unlike Lotus in their way. And... They existed as Renault Sport from that period on. Coming back to the Alpine name, I met someone in a pub in Conwick talking about the car. And she said, oh, my dad had a Renault Alpine, I think it was called. What he had was a Renault 5 Alpine, which wasn't sold as the Alpine in Britain. It was called the Gordini here that other sporting wing that had been absorbed by Renault. Because of copyright reasons, because she couldn't call it Alpine. It was known as the Renault 5 Alpine all over Europe. In Britain, it was the Gordini. So, you know, real heritage. I was saying to someone just yesterday that I don't think Renault have made a bad sports car for 20 years. You think of all the Megans and the Clios that have been really highly rated from the Renault Sport division. Was it the Coupe 180, I think, or the Coupe 230, I think I had at one point, which was amazing. And so, yeah, they can do it. But then, that whole deal, do you remember when Caterham were in Formula One? They'd come in as Lotus, weren't allowed to use the Lotus brand anymore, and so re badged themselves as Caterham and Tony Fernandez bought I don't know if he bought outright but he bought huge shares or certainly took a controlling stake in Caterham road cars as well and they went into an agreement with Renault to use what was the Alpine factory in Dieppe to build a car that would be sold as an Alpine A110 and as a Caterham forgive me I don't know the name of that car of course the whole Caterham thing went bust for one reason or another as so often happens to little manufacturers like that but Renault went ahead bought back the factory because Caterham had bought 50% of the Dieppe factory so Renault were able to buy it back at a bargain and I suppose the money they saved from that they invested in getting the Alpine out on their own as opposed to in a partnership and um, what a great car. I'd love to know what the Caterham interpretation of this would be. But do you know what? The Alpine interpretation's 
pretty good. Really good. Okay, let's have a listen to the car. Let's start her up. It does make a sweet pie noise. Right, I think I'm going to put, I will go away music. I'm going to put a route into my navigation, which will take me from where I am now in the Vale of Cluid to the edge of Snowdonia where I'm meeting some friends this evening so I'm going to put in an interesting route that takes me on some interesting roads and then I'll tell you about it when I've done it hello it's Tuesday today and I got this car on Wednesday drove up on Thursday and I'm still driving it but unfortunately today is the day I have to drive back to London in it. However, when presented with a car as much fun to drive as this is, what you do is you get a little bit earlier than you planned and you take the long way round. I always remember a questionnaire in Car Magazine years and years and years ago which was when was the last time you got up early in the morning just to go driving <laughs> not necessarily to go somewhere but just to go for a drive and that sort of idea hovers in the back of my mind every now and again if I think I haven't got up early to go driving then I better get up early and go driving I'm really enjoying this car. I've discovered something new about it. I think I said earlier on on the programme that it had two modes, normal and sport. Wrong! It's got three modes, because if you press and hold the sport button on the steering wheel, it goes into track mode. Yes! Yes! turns everything off, you know, all the trashy control and all that stuff and it becomes a real hooligan. Not that I've actually driven it in that mode, because I think you need to be on a track or an extreme bit of road to enjoy that. Now, the bit of road I'm on at the moment, I'm not sure if it's extreme, but it's very much. Yes, it's time for some very driving. I'm near Corwem which is in the D Valley. Now, I'm sure you've heard me mention this before, but Corwem is forestry territory. It's all forestry around here. And forest tracks, which means a lot of Welsh rally drivers come from around here and drive around here. And not just Welsh rally drivers, but a Welsh Formula One driver. Tom Price was from near Corwem. That's where he learned to drive. So I'm in the right place to test this car. Although, quite frankly, sitting behind a RAV4, I'm not in the right position, in the right place, to test this car. It makes a lovely noise. I know I've mentioned that before, but I don't think you've heard enough of the noise this car makes. And let's see if I can give you a taste of it. Yes, Vim Vim, it says. Vim, a very sweet four-cylinder burble. Um, because it's mid-engine, it's got a short exhaust pipe, so it sounds a bit sort of... It's a bit Escort Mexico. I know we're not hearing the carburettors sucking air in, which gives the Mexico that distinctive sound. But it's definitely a Sporting 4 sound. I really, really, really like it. I do wish that the cars in front would get out of the way so I could drive this mother of a thing. It is quite a mother of a thing. <laughs> it has the ability to go very, very quickly. They've kept the weight down really, really well. I think it's 96% aluminium, this car. I don't know if they mean that by weight, because if they do, that's incredible. I think 90% by volume? Who knows? But that really does keep the weight down. And of course, you can change the laws of physics. So if you really want to make a car go quicker, don't stick a faster engine in it. Make everything lighter. Work for Colin. You can work for Jean. I'm sure you get that reference. Gareth Jones on
welcome to the peace and quiet of Telford Services. Yes, I'm on the M54 and I've paused on my way to Leicester just to give you a few final thoughts on the Alpine A110. Do you remember me saying that I was disappointed when it was delivered because it was a white one and it was the pure, not the blue legend spec that I was initially expecting? The reason for that, why the car was switched at the last minute, was that the windscreen had become cracked on the one that I was going to have. And so they were waiting for replacement windscreen, weren't sure if they were going to get it in time, so would this other car be okay? Yes, it would be fine. And similar things just happened to me. Driving down the motorway, a bit of a stunk, and I looked and there is a small star-shaped mark in the bottom right-hand side of the windscreen of this car. Now, here's the thought. Is it a coincidence that two cars, both Alpines, have had cracked windscreens in a few days. Is it the fact that this is a very low car and so we're down amongst all the trucks, much lower than the wheel height of a truck, and therefore more prone to getting hit with stones? Or is there some kind of design fault where the chassis is flexing and the windscreen is cracking. I don't think it's the third, because I don't detect any chassis flex. It's pretty rigid, this. And actually, this windscreen isn't cracked at great length. It's just got a little hit with a little star-shaped mark. So maybe it's just a function of being low. Worth thinking about that. Okay, let's tell you a little bit about the spec of this car, because I haven't done it properly. I mentioned that I said it was about 248 brake, and I was right. It was 248 at 6,000 revs. That's 252 PS. Torque, 320 newton metres uh, to, to 5,000 revs. It seems to make a difference. The maximum weight of this car is 1,098 kilos. I kept saying that it was light, didn't I? But that is really very light, isn't it? The WLTP economy figure is 44 miles to the gallon. I've scored about 36 on the run-up and about 28 on the last bit through the A5 and some very spirited driving. And maximum speed limited to 155 miles per hour. Yeah, you probably don't need to go much quicker than that, do you? List price of this car, £46,000, but with all the extras and the on-the-road cost, the first registration fee and the VD, uh, this car comes up to £53,558. That's because it's got some options featuring the iridescent white paint, 1600 quid, aluminium passenger footrest, 90 quid, does look nice though. Alpine A logo in the center of the steering wheel, that's an extra eight pounds. Kind of surprised at that. Lightweight focal audio system with two speakers and two tweeters, 552 pounds. That's a great audio system, by the way, it's very good. High performance front and rear braking systems. 320 millimeter diameter discs, 936 pounds for that. Cargo net behind driver and storage case, 468 pounds. Really, little leather cargo box. This is a sweet little thing because there's no glove compartment. There is a lovely little triangular leathery box. Yeah, it is leather sitting in between the two seats in the car. That's pretty voluminous actually. The Alpine Telemetrics is an extra £192. The blue Alpine brake calipers, Brembo's, 360 quid for those. My sister thought I had something trapped in my wheel. Oh, you got something trapped in your wheel? No, it's the blue brake calipers. And the sports exhaust system with an active valve is an extra £1,380. And it does sound good. It does have a real vim brim to it. And actually, I would argue, sounds better than the Porsche 714 Boxster, which is a very similar car. Servicing, one year, 12,000 miles. Warranty, three years, 60,000 miles. I am deeply, deeply impressed with this car, what it can do, and how it's put together. If I had any criticisms of it, I think they're really minor. The switch gear, it's a bit unfathomable. I've been trying to work out, you've got a selector on one stalk and an up-down on the other stalk. And that gives you the readout in the dash. I haven't quite ultimately worked out. 
the buttons for the sat nav, the home button is a little tiny, tiny plus button. That's too small to touch when you're moving. It's too small. But it does have three buttons on screen which take you to the basics of sat nav, phone, and the other one. Not sure what the other one was. So it's okay. It's not the greatest sat nav, but it's really good. Really good. If there was anything I would change in this car, it would be the pedal the brake pedal nothing wrong with the accelerator but the brake pedal i find i can't press the brake pedal without actually touching the pedal itself rather than the pad that your toe is supposed to go on i know i've got fairly big feet and i've experimented with a number of different positions but i can't quite get that right it's as though the lever that the pad of your foot pedal sits on isn't forward enough and doesn't clear the aluminium behind so i'm touching it and on a couple of occasions i've gone to brake and I thought oh i'm not actually touching the brake as accurately as i would like that's the only thing i change on this car although to be honest i think i might like a convertible version yeah. Oh, the boots. The boots are funny. I didn't realise that the rear boot is pretty much the same volume as the front bonnet, or fruit, or whatever we're calling it. Both at about 200 litres, but very different shapes. But that's a useful size. But I have to make a confession. I made a terrible mistake. I thought this would be the perfect car to drive up to North Wales in, because it's an Alpine, and I was going up to the Welsh Alps. Well, I have to make a confession. I never actually made it into the Welsh Alps this time. We boarded Snowdonia, but I never actually went in. I did drive it around Llanfair Vechan, Penmine Mawr, Conwy, A5, Dufferin Clwyd, you know, lots of great roads. But I never actually took it to that which is called the Alps. And I have another confession to make. I remembered it wrong. The reason I thought Snowdonia was referred to as the Welsh Alps was that my friends Carol and Steve, in their lovely house, have a poster on the wall. Come by train to North Wales. And I thought it said, to Snowdonia, the Welsh Alps. It didn't. It said, come to Snowdonia, the Welsh Rockies. (laughs) It's funny how you misremember things. And apparently, yeah, they don't refer to Snowdonia as the Welsh Alps at all. I should have known that. The Welsh Rockies, really. So, if this car is an Alpine as opposed to an Alpine, and I took it to the Welsh Rockies, maybe this car should be a Rocky. A Rocky A110. Who knows? Tell you, whatever you want to call it, what a car. I absolutely believe in this car it's not a supercar but it's not far off you know is it a poor man's porsche yeah i think it is yeah i think that's a good description the interior of the car it's not porsche standard but it's not sort of crappy plastic either i think it's really good it's the sort of thing that you get in a posh sporting ford that sort of level you know that when you get in a posh ford you can still see familiar ford switch gear but it's sort of ramped up a little bit. There's something sporting and a bit more upmarket about it. Well, Alpine do that. It doesn't look like a Renault inside. It doesn't. It obviously uses lots of Renault bits. Disguises it really well. Very nice. I thought this was going to be the most frustrating car in the world. Because it really wants to go. Good Lord, it wants to go. And I thought that sitting behind traffic in North Wales would just make you frustrated. In a car like this. Oh, I should be going quicker. And therefore, it wouldn't be a satisfying car to live with. But I was wrong. I was proved wrong in one moment. I was coming from Trelawney down to Codwen on a lovely wiggly road. And the chap in a car in front going quite slowly. Because he was behind a truck. And as soon as there was an opportunity to get past, I changed down with the paddles and blipped past them. And bang! Was gone up the road at an astronomical speed. Then I looked behind and I saw the chap who was trying to overtake the truck and he didn't even have time to get past that truck before another corner. So no frustration really, frustration for him because you can't get past slower vehicles. In a car like this, you don't need much space to get past vehicles that are travelling more slowly. Because it's so light, just over a thousand kilos, because it's got a quarter of a century of brake horsepower, it can get past things really quickly. And any frustration you may have had is quickly dispensed with.
what a car. Love the Alpine. You've been listening to Gareth Jones on Speed. I'm Gareth. In the next show, we're going to be attempting something rather special. Stick around, you'll find out. See ya. To send us an email, see pictures, get song lyrics, join our Facebook fan site, follow us on Twitter, or to find out about sponsorship opportunities, go to garethjones.tv. Gareth Jones on Speed is made in London by Whizbang. Gareth Jones on Speed! Speed! Speed!